Well, I'm excited to get into the Word with you tonight. My name is Matt. I get to serve here as one of the pastors. We obviously have the banner service next Wednesday. How many of you have been to a banner service before? All right, I like that. There's a little bit of enthusiasm about that as well. How many of you went to a banner service when you were a child here at Calvary? That was me. We were like marching around with our banners, letting everyone know what we were so thankful for. I think mine probably mainly revolved around cartoons. Um, and then, of course, I would throw a few spiritual things on there as well. So make sure to make your way out to that. And then, of course, right after the banner service, we have the tree lighting happening out in the amphitheater. Now, quick poll. How many of you have already decorated for Christmas? Just a few of you. How many of you think that prior to Thanksgiving is way too early? Okay, how many of you are like Friday after Thanksgiving, that's you? Okay, so we're like fairly evenly split. Well, you'll want to make sure to come to service this weekend. We are having a big weekend. Pastor Skip is going to be back in the pulpit. We're looking forward to that. But for tonight in our purposes right now, would you guys join me in prayer? Father, we want to come before you as your church, as your people, as your called out ones. We came here to worship you. We came here to, to make noise celebrating the God that you are. We came here to join together and say, no matter what mountain is in front of us, we're not going to be stopped from praising the God that deserves the breath in our lungs. And right now, God, we just want to enter into a moment, enter into a period of time where we're sitting at your feet we open our Bibles so that we can read your word, recognizing that your word is what we need. And so we ask that you would come and you would meet us here in these moments and in this place. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys can open up to 2 Kings chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, there's usually a Bible under the seat in front of you, or there's probably a Bible on your phone. Um, but if there's not a Bible on your phone, you can just download one real quick. We love to hear stories of people who have been successful and they've pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. We love to hear stories of, about people who have put in the all-nighters like Elon Musk who slept in his office in the early days of PayPal. We love to hear stories of people who have gone through deserts, marched through and come out victorious on the other side. Stories whether it's scholars like Francis Collins or Einstein, maybe adventurers like Armstrong and Aldrin, Lewis and Clark, Frodo and Sam, Entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, or Jeffrey Bezos. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos. Well, tonight we're going to be introduced to such a man. You guys saw that I enjoyed that so much more than anyone else in here. <laughs> Thank you for letting me enjoy that moment with you. Sometimes we like to hear stories and read stories, biographies of conquerors like Alexander, Julius Caesar, and Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, tonight we are introduced to seemingly such a man as that. Somebody who had a very successful military career, somebody that was second only to the king in the nation in which he served. He was enormously wealthy. He was the right hand to the king of Syria. You could say that he was the Alexander Hamilton to the Syria's George Washington. So when he walked in the room, everyone said, here comes the general. No, no one. That's Okay, these are all the things that I enjoy. So <laughs> Hamilton, no one. All right. Uh, well, we are here in 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's look at verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5. Five. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper, but a leper. 
Now, leprosy is probably something that most of us are familiar with. We're first introduced to leprosy in, anyone know? Exodus chapter 4, verse 6, God tells Moses, he's about to flex his muscles and say, hey, I want you to go to Pharaoh. You're going to say, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he's going to be like, nah, 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 nah. I, don't, I really got to stop with all the singing tonight. But we're introduced to leprosy there because God tells Moses to put his hand in his cloak and he pulls his hand out and it's like white and it's leprous, leprous and it's disease. And then he says, now put it back in and then pull it out again and you're healed and you're clean, which is interesting to see that the very first time that we're even introduced in the Bible to leprosy is a time that God is miraculously healing that leprosy. But leprosy happens some 55 times in the Bible it's mentioned. 35 times we're talked, it's talked about as leprosy, 20 times it's talked about as somebody that is a leper or has that. And so it's a pretty significant thing. Anytime that you've got something talked about that frequently, you want to be somewhat versed in that as a student of the Bible. Well, today in America, leprosy actually does still exist, but it's a lot more treatable now, and it's actually referred to as Hansen's disease. And usually it's about 12 months of drug treatment, so it's a little bit of steroids and uh, antibiotics, a little bit of prednisone and uh, penicillin. Just kidding, those aren't the actual medicines. I'm not a doctor. Please don't try that. <laughs> if you do have leprosy, I, which I doubt anybody in here does. But I did find this uh, off the website for uh, the American Academy of Dermatology. It says this, that leprosy, listen, if you're an American, if you're living here, and you're concerned about leprosy, there are ways to prevent getting this Hansen's disease or leprosy. leprosy. It says you can reduce your risk. Dermatologists recommend the two following things. Never handle an armadillo. Stay out of places where you find armadillos. So if you have leprosy here, stop touching those armadillos. And that's the title of the message tonight. Just kidding. So Naaman was the second in command. He was essentially the secretary of defense. He was in charge of all of the armies. I guess the second command here in the States is the VP, but he was over all of the armies. He had been incredibly successful, but he was a leper. And we joke about it and we talk about armadillos and all of that, but for him it was no joke because it meant certain death. You see, for a leper, there was no cure. It was a disease that would start slowly. It would spread slowly, but it would spread effectively. Eventually, the leper's hands and feet, their fingers and toes, even their nose, their ears, their appendages, they would start to go numb and they would start then to get crippled. They would get stuck in the same position where they weren't able to open their hands and then after that, often it would move to the optical nerves, the eyes, and lepers would be left blind. And then ultimately, it would lead to their slow and painful death. Now, throughout the Bible, we often see parallels between sin and leprosy. Leviticus chapter 13 goes into great details of what's supposed to happen if somebody comes down with leprosy or they think that they have a case of leprosy. And I'm just going to say this. I'm so glad that I'm not an Old Testament priest and I get to be a New Testament uh, pastor because the Old Testament priest would end up inspecting all of these sores and it's like, well, if there's a white ring around it and if there's a piece of hair, if there's a hair coming out of the skin, then you're, then you're not good. That's really bad. And you've got to go tell people to quarantine for seven days. Then if it's gotten worse, then they've got to go live outside the camp, but if it's gotten better, they can quarantine for another seven days, and then, then if it's still good, then they quarantine for another seven days. So 21 days altogether, and we think we've got it bad with 10. Anyways, I'm glad that I'm not an Old Testament priest, but I will say this. So he has all these successes. He's got this whole Twitter bio. He's got, he's the second in command. He's had these military successes, but he was a leper. And I want to point this out that it doesn't say he was a commander that had leprosy. No, it became his identity. He was a leper. His affliction ended up becoming his identity. And I wonder how many of us are here 
like Naaman. Where maybe we've had great successes, maybe people have said amazing things about us, but we're allowing the afflictions that we face, the suffering that we're in, the disease or the difficulty that we're finding ourselves in to become our identity. Maybe you think of yourself as the screw-up or the failure or the sickly or the poor or just the not cool enough or you're the weirdo, you're the outcast. And that's what you think about yourself because of the situation you find yourself in. I think that each of us, that all of us at some point and each of us probably soon or right now are going through a time where we need to find a cure. And so Naaman, he was searching how to be healed. And that's going to be our title tonight, how to be healed. And like I said, this is the story of all of us. It doesn't matter what good things are said about you. It doesn't matter what promotions you've gotten at work. It doesn't matter uh, where you've been, what victories you've had, because with every mountaintop, there's eventually going to be a valley. So maybe you're, maybe you're not sick and afflicted right now, but chances are you and I are going to be. And so let's discover how to be healed. And as we discover how to be healed, as we look at this chapter, I really want to focus on four servants that are found throughout this chapter. There's three servants and then one group of servants, and we're going to kind of center around them. And the first one that we discover is a worried servant, a worried servant. Let's look at verse 2, chapter 5. Verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. When I say that she's a worried servant, I'm not saying that she's anxious, she's not going all around freaking out about what's going to happen, but she's concerned about her master. She kind of embodies Philippians 2, 3 that says, let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Who is this girl? She's a young slave girl. Now, each of those three words really disqualifies her from being the medical advisor in Naaman's life. She was young, she was a slave, and she was a girl, which in that society, in that culture, meant that she was the wrong age, she was the wrong status, and frankly, she was the wrong gender to advise a Syrian general. He's probably been a general in the army longer than she's been alive. And here she is, a Jewish young girl who had been brought in as a slave. Now, the Jews and the Syrians were at odds. Before chapter 5, they're they're fighting. After chapter 5, they're fighting. Here we find ourselves in this story, and we're told that Naaman had sent out a raid and he had brought her captive from the land of Israel. Likely what had happened is this Naaman, this great and mighty guy, had her family killed and brought her out of her homeland as a captive and then as a slave in his house. So a little bit of context here. We're entering into, we're in 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings kind of chronicles everything from the end of Elijah's life all the way until the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So that means that the kingdom is already divided. There's the the northern kingdom of Israel, the the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom of Judah, which is the two tribes. Samaria is kind of the headquarters for the northern kingdom, and Jerusalem is the headquarters for the southern kingdom. And we're going to be introduced to, soon, this character called Elisha. He's a prophet in Samaria. She's exact, or he is exactly who she was talking about. If only my master could be with the prophet in Samaria. Elijah, Elisha, was Elijah's successor. You remember the whole story of Elijah. He was carried up to, to heaven in the, the chariots of fire. He tosses down his cloak, and since Elisha saw that, he got a double portion 
We have 28 miracles recorded in the Bible that Elisha performed, and three of them we're going to see, or three of them are in this chapter of the Bible. So Syria and Israel are building tension. There's conflict before and after this chapter. Like I said, it's likely that Naaman had this girl's family killed, and then he human trafficked her all the way back 100 miles away from her home to live in Damascus under his household. And so you think, why in the world is this young slave girl hoping the best for this evil, cruel man? Why in the world would this oppressed girl care at all about her oppressor? And yet she mutters the words, if only my master could see the prophet in Samaria, then he would be healed. The grace of God had been demonstrated to her at some point because what she was doing was not natural. And yet it's a lesson for all of us, especially those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus. We've been forgiven of our sins. How much more should we forgive the sins of those who sin against us? Several decades ago, there was a 10-year-old boy. His name was Chris Courier. He's 10 years old, and he was met by a robber who... Um, he. He stabbed him multiple times with an ice pick at the age of 10 years old, this kid was. And then he was even shot. This man shot and stabbed this kid. And then he left him for dead. Well, authorities found him hours later. And remarkably, he lost his vision, but he was able to recover otherwise. Decades go by, and Chris Courier finds out that the criminal who had attacked him was on his deathbed. And so one of the police officers that found Chris that day had encouraged him, hey, you need to go confront him. Before he dies, you need to go confront him. And Chris says, I'm not going to confront him. I'm going to comfort him. I'm going to go see that, 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 that good is done for him. I'm going to wish well on him. And so he met him in his hospital, and he took care of him, and he forgave him for all he had done. You remember the story of Corey Ten Boone and probably Louis Zamperini. Both of them were prisoners at different times in history, actually the same war during the Holocaust. Louis Zamperini was in Japan and he was beaten every single day by this guy that was named the Bird. And he had PTSD. Once he was finally no longer a prisoner of war, he came back to the States and he became an alcoholic and he had so much trauma and he couldn't even sleep at night. And he hated this man so much for all of the years of torture that he had put Louis through. But then Louis came to know Jesus at a Billy Graham crusade. And years later, like 40 years later, Louis was in Japan and he tried to set up a meeting to meet the bird simply so that he could forgive him. This is not normal, but this is what's possible when we've experienced the grace of a good and loving God. I think that all too often in the society, in 2021, in the day that we are living in, all too often we get excited, we get energized at the downfall of our enemies and our oppressors or our opponents. You see something that somebody posts on social media and it's like, man, I hope they get sick and die. It's like, okay, well, maybe that's not that extreme, but maybe it's in the workplace. Maybe there's somebody that drives you insane and you're seeking their demise. I hope she gets fired. I hope they find out the truth about her. You're hoping and wishing ill on those that are your oppressors. And we would do well to learn a lesson from this little unnamed slave girl. Let's look at how this story continues to unfold. Verse 4, Naaman hears about this from, from this little slave girl, and he goes to the king. He said, and Naaman went in and told his master, that's the king of, of Syria, that's Ben-Hadad II, he goes in and he tells his master, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. 
Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Now this Ben-Hadad, the second guy, he's not like a good guy, but he loved Naaman. He loved his right-hand man. And so he said, hey, like, listen, like, if, if there's a chance that you're going to be healed, I'll provide the money, I'll provide the clothes, you go to Israel, I'll even send a letter. I know that we're not really on great terms, the king and I, since we're constantly trying to kill each other, but I'm going to send a letter, and he's going to, he, we'll make sure that if there's a healer out there, they're going to heal you. Get this, it says, and this is, this is just wild to think about, but it's a... Uh, he sends him with the silver, the gold, and the Gucci. He sends him with 750, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. That's like one good-sized human of gold. And ten, 10 changes of clothes. Why? Well, one, because gifts, when you're going, coming from one king to another, you're having any sort of correspondence, gifts is maybe a good way to win some favor, but especially when you're asking for a miracle from one of your enemies. You've got to think like, oh man, yeah, we're constantly at each other's throats, we're trying to destroy each other's nation, but I really want my general to be saved, I want him to be healed, it's not going to be cheap. The cost of the cure is not going to come for free surely it's going to cost us a lot. So let's just send everything we have. Let's send a lot of money. So in his search to be healed, what's the cure? Maybe the, maybe the cure is money. Maybe that's what it's going to take. He's trying to earn his cure with the ways of the world here, though. And I don't want to blame him because that's kind of the only way that he knows He's rich and he's powerful and he's probably lived an entire life of, hey, if I want something, I just wave enough money or I flash my title around and I let people know that I'm powerful and I've got armies and he gets what he wants. Well, Naaman's presented with a problem where maybe for the first time in his life, he can't just wave money around and get what he wants. It's not something that can be bought, this cure for leprosy, this healing and so I want to be gentle and gracious with him, though, because he is trying. He's seeking for the cure. And I think that we should be kind. We should be gentle. We should be gracious when we come across seekers that maybe aren't doing it the right way. They're not using the lingo that we like to use. They're not uh, ascribing to the same exact practices that we try to ascribe to but they're seeking. You can tell they're looking for healing. You can tell they're looking for the Savior. They're interested in God. And so let's be careful to not cast them aside just because they're not using the right lingo. Naaman will soon discover, though, that God's not impressed with pomp, and the cure isn't going to be as complicated as he thinks. But look where he goes. The girl said, if only... If only my master were with the prophet that's in Samaria. And then where he goes is not to the prophet in Samaria, but to the king in a palace. Probably because he had all of these preconceived notions as to how he was going to get healed. Verse 6. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said... Again, this is from the king of Syria. Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. I don't know if you've ever had the package, like, from Amazon delivered to the wrong house. I don't know if you've maybe received somebody else's mail before. That seems to be a little bit of the situation going on here. And it gives us, actually, an insight into the spiritual state of Israel and into the spiritual mindset of the king. So we were just introduced to King Joram of Israel. That's the king of Israel who received that letter. Everybody say, hi, King Joram. Just kidding, don't say that. 
So King Joram, he's the king of Israel. A little bit of background on him. He is the son of Ahab and Jezebel, also known as the Wicked Witch of the West. She came from the west coast of Lebanon, so I think she's appropriately named as that. But we get a little bit of an insight that the nation of Israel really hasn't improved a whole lot from the days of Elijah when Elijah called down fire from heaven on top of Mount Carmel and because everybody was worshiping Baal. We see here in, in, in the king's response that he is terrified and he seems to have no idea that the God that he serves, the God that he represents is a miracle working God. He's completely forgotten all about the history of his nation. He's forgotten about the fact that his nation began and that was a miracle in itself that Moses had put his hand in the cloak brought it out and he was healed he had forgotten about the the Red Sea that they had crossed through on dry land this king had forgotten the history and the power of God in his history and in his own life because surely the king even knew about Elisha and all of the miracles that Elisha had already committed in his own life within the last few months probably and yet he's terrified and it's interesting to see that this pagan king the king of Syria seems to have a lot more faith in the God of Israel than the, than the, than the king of Israel has in the God of Israel one commentator pointed out that he was so blinded by his fear that he missed an opportunity to be a part of a miracle and I wonder how many times God wants us to be a part of something, but we're allowing our fear because we're freaked out. And we're, how in the world would this happen? How in the world would God use me here? How in the world would God ever show up here? And we allow our fear to keep us to be a part from something truly incredible that God wants to do in us. So what happens is Elisha reaches out to the king and he says, hey, you don't need to tear your clothes. That kind of got awkward for all of us. We have no idea why you were doing that. Mr. Hulk, angry, furious man. He says, just send him my way. Send him my way. Let's read verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. I love that that's Elisha's motivation. He wants Naaman, this pagan king who had been an oppressor to Israel, he wants him to know that there's a prophet in Israel. Hey, there might not be a king in Israel, but there's a prophet in Israel. Hey, the king might be abdicating his duties, but the prophet's not, not falling to the side. He's not, he's not going to allow himself to be defied. And I think that it's also really important that he doesn't say, I want Naaman to know that there's a healer in Israel. Specifically, he says, I want him to know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, the role of a prophet is to tell forth the word of God, to speak directly the truth of God, to explain the word of God. And I think that that's why Elisha says, hey, I want him to know that there's a prophet here, somebody that where God's word lives in him, where God's word is declared. And I think that you and I would be, we would do well to take a note from this. You know, I think a lot of times we're tempted to start searching for the solution for our problems elsewhere other than God's Word, where God's Word is where we need to start. We need to remember, no, there's a prophet. There's God's Word in my house. And I'm going to go there first. So let's see, let's see how Naaman takes to that. Verse 9, then Naaman went with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And just a quick side note, anytime that like I go to somebody's house for the very first time, this is absolutely the worst part of going to somebody's house for the first time, is standing at the door. I don't know about, is anyone else with me there? It's like, did they hear me knock? Should I knock again? Is it rude to knock again? Did they only answer if you ring the doorbell? Should I ring the doorbell? Is that weird? Is that rude? Oh, the dog's barking. Okay, that's a good sign. Is it a big dog? Is it going to be friendly? Is it going to bite me? 
is there anything in my teeth? I forgot to check. Well, Naaman is here at Elisha's door. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger. He sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand around over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpa rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Now I will say this, this was not a typical greeting at that time. It was not customary to just send, send a servant out and then shut the door and leave. I mean, this guy came a hundred miles to come see Elisha, the, the prophet, to be healed, to find his cure. He knocks on the door, and Elisha doesn't even come out to see him. That wasn't customary. I mean, even if it was not somebody of high-level importance, you would go out, and as the master of the house, you would greet them. You might bring them in for some Turkish coffee, some falafel. You might have a nice time. They were known for being hospitable. I'm going to take care of you, and as long as you're on my property, I'm, in, I'm responsible for your well-being. So when this second-in-command, Secretary of Defense of Syria, comes knocking on Elisha's door, and he doesn't even give him the time of the day, and he just sends his servant out and says, hey, go dip in the river seven times, and then shuts the door. Yeah, it was a little rude. It wasn't customary. But God knew that as much as Naaman needed to be healed from his leprosy, he had a, a greater sickness that he needed to be healed from as well. And that was his pride. And sometimes the only way to deal with pride is to be brought low. And so God, because of his great grace towards Naaman, made his welcome in Elisha's house anything but that. Elisha sends his servant, probably Gehazi. We read about him in previous chapters. We read about him later in this chapter even. He sends him out and he gives Naaman simple instructions. Go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Goodbye. Shuts door. Go dip seven times and you shall be clean. Now that's what Naaman was all about, wasn't it? He wanted to be clean. He wanted to be cured. He wanted to be healed. That's what he was after. So why in the world is he not rejoicing right now, throwing the football down, doing an end zone dance? He's not posting on social media. He's not getting ecstatic. He's just been given the answer. Nobody in all of Israel had been cured of leprosy. And Elisha tells this guy, you can be cured. Just go dip seven times in that, that Jordan River. And he starts throwing a fit because he's above that. Are you kidding me? Me in that river? This stinking Israelite river? The rivers in Damascus are much nicer. Why was he furious? Why was he filled with rage? Two things I think of. Entitlement and failed expectations. Naaman expected the red carpet to be rolled out. Welcome, great Naaman. He wanted the, the presidential songs on the trumpets to start playing as soon as he entered. He wanted to be greeted. He wanted to be schmoozed. He wanted to be treated well. And instead, he's just given a simple solution. And so that turns into anger. The word furious and rage are both used. Question for you, question for me. How do we, how do you respond when life doesn't go as planned? Do you get upset? Do you get angry? Do you take it out on your wife or your kids? Do you start chewing people out? There's two lessons that I think make life so much better to deal with entitlement and failed expectations. Number one, I deserve nothing. Anything beyond that is a gift. 
we deserve everlasting punishment. Anything beyond that is the grace of God. Lesson number two, my lack of control does not mean he is not in control. Just because it's unplanned for me does not mean that it's unplanned for God. Just because I can't control the circumstances that I'm in does not mean that he is not in control. So the next time that plans don't pan out and you start feeling the heat of anger rise within you, let that be like a warning sign, like a check engine light on the dashboard of your soul when you start getting angry. And remember, we don't deserve anything. It's all a gift. God's ways are not our ways. We might not understand why there's a mountain in front of us. We might not understand why we're in the valley. But he's never failed us yet. And he's still got this. He grumbles, the rivers in Syria are better than, than the Jordan River. But I also want to point this out because here we can come across this and we can be like, Naaman is such an idiot. Are you kidding me? He's throwing a fit about this. But at the same time, God didn't give up on him, even in the midst of his tantrum. God was pursuing him through all of that. Even as he is making fun of God's chosen nation and the water that's there, God's not done with him. The second servants that we come across are here in verses 13 and 14. So if the first servant was the worried servant, the second ones are the wise servants, 13 and 14. His servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says, wash and be clean. Pretty simple, right? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. I love that Naaman had some good servants around him. I love that he had some men in his life, even though they reported to him, they weren't peers with him, he had some guys in his life that were ready and willing to call him on his stuff. It's like, hey, Naaman, you're about to miss, like, maybe one of the greatest miracles ever. You're about to miss the very thing that you've been searching for because you're being a little, like, dumb. Like, had he told you to go do something incredibly difficult, you would have done it. He told you to do something stupid easy and you're not willing to do it. And I love that there's not like a whole lot of back and forth with it. He's like, it doesn't even say that he responds to them. His response was he went down into the river and he dipped seven times. But I, I think let's not despise the art of persuasion. You know, Paul in Corinth, right when he met Aquila and Priscilla, he discovered that they were all tent makers, and so they were going to work together, and then they were going to do ministry together. And we're told in Acts 18 that Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he persuaded, persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So if we're looking at Naaman's story as that of somebody that doesn't know God and these servants as people that are ministering to him to bring him nearer to God, then that little slave girl is kind of doing the work of an evangelist. She's just sharing the good news. Man, there's a prophet that would probably heal you. And so he goes and he starts searching, but then he hit some roadblocks. He hit some obstacles. He hit some things that were difficult for him to, him to grapple with. And so he didn't need an evangelist at that point. At that point, he needed an apologist. And so these servants step in and they say, well, here's a few obstacles that you're kind of struggling with, but let's wrestle through those together. And I love that that's so near the heart of God. He says, come, let us reason together. He doesn't say like, oh, if you don't believe me the first time, like, I'm just done with you. He doesn't say, oh, well, you were too prideful a little while back. I'm, I'm finished. And I think that you and I as Christians have a responsibility to the unbelievers in our city, to the unbelievers in our sphere of influence. I think that we have a responsibility to know the questions that they have. 
I think that we have a responsibility to know what things are, are making them stumble or stumping them or keeping them from the truth. And I think that we have a responsibility to do the hard work of finding the answers of how the Bible addresses those things. If there's somebody at your work that's really just hung up with the fact that the Bible doesn't condone the LGBTQ movement, then you don't just shrug your shoulders and say, well, I guess they'll just never come to the Lord. You say, I'm going to do the hard work of finding out what the Bible does say, and I'm going to love them through that entire process. If there's somebody at your school that is struggling with points of atheism, and they don't understand how we could believe that truth is so exclusive, then you have the responsibility to do the hard work of struggling through those answers for them. Thank God for these wise servants that he had in his life. Hey, do you have wise friends that are around you? Have you given people in your life the opportunity and the responsibility, the privilege, the freedom, the liberty to speak into your life when they see that something's awry? I thank God for people who have done that in my life. Those are always the most uncomfortable conversations, but usually on the other side of that uncomfortable conversation is healing. Just like is the case here, these wise servants probably didn't want to say, hey, like Naaman, we disagree with you. We think you're dumb. But on the other side of that was healing for him. He got baby skin after that. It was a pretty good deal. Maybe there's a conversation that the Lord's calling you to have with somebody in your life. Or maybe the call to action for you is to make sure that the people in your life know that they have that opportunity. So let's look at what his servant said. His servant said, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? The answer is obviously, yeah, I, I would have done that. I would have done the something great. Why would he have done something great? Well, two things. Probably because he was desperate. We know he was desperate. He already did something great by bringing like millions and millions and millions of dollars of clothes and gold and silver. So he had showed that he was willing to do the difficult things but also because we love that feeling as though we've accomplished something on our own, that we've brought ourselves out of our mess by ourselves. We're kind of addicted to religion. We love to feel the dopamine rush of we've done it ourselves. Had Elisha sent Naaman to cross over the dead marshes all the way to Mordor, he would have done it. But that would have been reason for Naaman to boast in himself. That would have been reason for Naaman to pat himself on the back. The leprosy would be gone, sure, but the issue of his pride would still remain. You know, Jesus calls us to something so simple. Jesus calls us to something so foolish that there's never room for us to pat ourselves on the back. The gospel makes no sense when it comes to our accomplishment. The gospel is simply Jesus did what we could not do because this isn't a story of pulling ourselves up from the bootstraps. The gospel refuses to be that story. So Jesus came and did what you and I never could do. And he simply asks, believe Admit you're wrong, follow me. Believe and you will be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Did you know that you and I bring nothing to our salvation except the sin there's nothing that we add to that equation except for the fact that we're the wrongdoers. The only thing that we bring is our leprosy, is our sickness. What's wild, what's wild to me, jumping back into the story of Naaman, is that he almost missed his miracle. He almost missed this healing. Pride will do that. Pride will keep you 
from God's best for you. Years ago, I went to the Grand Canyon. I lived in Phoenix, but the Grand Canyon was still like two and a half, maybe three hour drive uh, from us. And a friend flew in to Phoenix and he wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. He was gonna go hike for seven days from rim to rim. And he's like, Matt, can you give me a ride? So we drove for three hours. We got there after it was already dark. We couldn't see a thing. Um, and we pulled up to this lodge. We you know, had Google Maps and the address was on my phone. So we just pull up to this little cabin, this little lodge. We get in, we sleep. And then um, I was like, cool, well, I'm going to go back to Phoenix. And he's like, all right, I'll see you. And so he goes and spends seven days looking at this majestic masterpiece of creation. Uh, I did not realize that we were only 100 feet from the Grand Canyon. And so I just left without even looking. I had seen it once before in my life at that point. But I missed out on something because I didn't realize how close I was to having it. And I didn't have anybody in my life to say, hey, Matt, it's actually just 100 feet. Do you have five minutes? <laughs> well, pride will keep us. We could be so close to something, but pride will keep us from fully enjoying that all, all that God has for us. The wise servants were willing to correct him, and I'm sure that he was glad that they did. I love that it says, and his flesh was restored like the, the flesh of a little child. Just because I like that verse is in the Bible, but also because God never does anything half-heartedly. I love that Naaman didn't return to the skin that he was in two years prior, or right before the leprosy arrived. When God gets a hold of us, and he saves us, we're born again. We're made like little children in him. When God gets a hold of us and he does his work, behold, there is a new creation. He makes all things new. I don't know if you get those software update notifications on your phone. Uh, every once in a while, I'll get a software update notification. I'm like, oh, sweet, new software. That's awesome. And, uh, uh, you know, what new things are they going to be able to do? Will it be holographic? Can I send things through the mail? Will I be able to fly? And, uh, and then every once in a while, it, you know, you click on it, and it says, this is what's in this new update. And it says, some bug fixes and slight improvements. And I'm like, bug fixes? I didn't even realize there were bugs in my phone. Like, that's all you're going to do for me? Well, that's not the way that God works. He hooks you up with a brand new phone and a brand new operating system when you come to him. The third servant that we're going to see is the worshiping servant. Verse 15, we see the worshiping servant. And he returned to the man of God. This is Naaman. Naaman returned to the man of God. He and all his aides. And he came and he stood before him and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. What's really incredible is that a lot of times we focus just on the leprosy leaving, but I think that this verse right here is almost more of a miracle than some skin getting patched up and put together. This is the commander of the armies of Syria. This is the right hand to the king of Syria. He lived in a culture of worshiping thousands of gods. He had probably committed his life to serving Baal, or in Syria, they called him Ramon. That's funny that you like that. <laughs> I like that too, I guess. Not Ramon, but Ramon. Uh, he was an Italian god. Just kidding, sorry. <laughs> I digress. What's miraculous about this is that Naaman has this experience and then he forfeits and he says, none of those other gods are real. I now know that there is one God, not just in Israel, there is one God in all of the earth and he is the God of Israel. Anyways, I just want to point that out, how incredibly miraculous that is and that we should be celebrating the spiritual growth in people's life just as much as we do the outward or physical growth in their lives. 
So he returned to the man of God and he and all his aides and came and stood before him and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon, Ramon, however you want to say it, I guess, to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. I called this, this third servant the worshiping servant, and the, the one that I'm talking about is Naaman. We were very first introduced to him in verse 1 as this great and powerful and mighty you know, second to the king of Syria, man who also was a leper. But none of those terms are used of him here. Because after coming to Christ, after having this experience, his identity seems to have shifted from being a leper to being four times he, he tells Elisha, I'm your servant, I'm your servant, I'm your servant, I'm your servant. Acknowledging that because his perspective of who God is changed, his perspective of who he is changed. And I think it's worth noting, not just his identity changed, but his activity changed with his identity. He starts worshiping God and saying, there's no other God, and even when I get back to Syria, I'm going to keep worshiping God. There's this whole weird thing about two mule loads worth of dirt. And I just kind of want to explain that really, really quickly. See, Naaman had said, like, hey, I want to give you all these gifts. You can still have the 750 pounds of gold and silver and all of these clothes and everything like that. And Elisha says, no way, never, I'm not going to accept it. Not because he didn't want to be rude, but because he never wanted Naaman to think that he could purchase the grace of God. And so he refuses that, and he says, well, at the very least, will you let me at least take, you know, a, you know, a few wheelbarrows worth of your dirt back to Syria? And it's like, okay, why, though, Naaman, you weirdo? <laughs> the idea is this, is the, the mindset at the time is that gods were regional, that they were tied to the location they were in. So the, the God of Israel was tied to the dirt of Israel which is a complete misconception. And you're like, wait a minute, didn't you just say that Naaman had this hugely transformational experience? Yeah, but that doesn't mean that he's a theological expert overnight. And so his idea is, I want to take this dirt back to Syria with me, and then I'm going to build an altar on this dirt so that I can worship the God of Israel even when I'm not in Israel which I think, even though it's kind of a naive way of looking at how God works, is still a really beautiful example of his adoration of God. And when we are healed, when we are saved, the only proper response is that we worship. Is that we worship. So Elisha doesn't really answer him because then the next thing that, that he says is, oh, by the way, because I'm, you know, the king's guy, I'm going to have to go into the temple of, of Ramon. Is it going to be okay? Like, just know that my heart's not going to be in those activities. I'm, I'm going to be worshiping the God of Israel even when I'm a part of those activities, which I think is really rad because I think a lot of us, when we're in the church of the living God, we have a hard time still focusing on God. A lot of times we're thinking about like what we did earlier that day or the tweets that we're wanting to send or what we're going to eat after service. And, and, um, and Naaman says, hey, even when I'm in the, the God of another, I mean, even when, I, when I'm in the temple of another God, all I'm going to be thinking about is the God of heaven. And so he's making this declaration. He says, can you, will your God pardon me for having to be a part of that culture still? 
And Elisha doesn't really answer that. He, he just kind of says, go in peace. It's like, well, is that a yes or is that a no? I don't know. But for thousands of years, we've been wanting to know how you answer that, Elisha. But he says, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. The word peace there is, as you know, the word shalom, which was a common greeting. It was a common farewell in the Hebrew culture. It still is to this day. You say shalom when you say hello. You say shalom when you say goodbye. Um, However, the meaning of that word is so much more than just a greeting or a goodbye. The word shalom speaks of a peace that is so much more than the absence of conflict. It's the active pursuance of wholeness. And so I think that, that, that it's so beautiful, this picture of Elisha and this picture even of this slave girl that want shalom for somebody that had at one point been in their oppressor. That they're seeking the shalom of the enemy. And that kind of leads me to our fourth and our final servant that we're looking at here in this passage. And it's not Gehazi. It's the servant. Because in each of these lowercase servants, we see a picture or an example of the servant, the servant of servants, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus himself said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I see glimpses of Jesus in that little slave girl who wanted the best for her enemy. Because as Jesus was being nailed to a cross for your sins and my sins, he was saying to God, Father, forgive the people that are holding the hammers right now. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I see Jesus even in, in Naaman's servants because he's willing to talk through the difficult trials that we're going through with us. He's willing to reason with us. He's willing to be with you in your pain and in your frustration and your anger. And like Naaman's servants didn't give up on Naaman, I see that Jesus, he doesn't give up on any of you. He doesn't give up on any of us. And I see that just as a leprosy couldn't be healed from within, it couldn't be bought, there was no power play to be had to make leprosy go away, Naaman was left desperate for healing to come from the outside, from the external. You and I are desperate in our sin to be forgiven, and we can't do it from within. We can't do it by good deeds. We can't do it by a certain amount of money given to the church. We can't do it at all. We can't march to Mordor. There's no task we can achieve but Jesus, who came to serve and not be served, he gave his life as a ransom for you. He exchanged his righteousness for your sinfulness so that you could be the righteousness of God in Jesus. And so our help, our healing, needs to come from without ourselves. And I think that like Naaman, I think there are probably a lot of Naamans in this room. I've been a Naaman. We overcomplicate. We so often are addicted to religion. Even after we've come to Christ, we wander back into this mindset of having to achieve favor with him. Of having to perform in order to be loved and forgiven. He didn't order us to march up a mountain to prove ourselves. I love that song that we were singing right before we started getting in the word tonight. It says, how high would I climb mountains? I would search and stop at nothing. You're just not that hard to find. For who could dare ascend that mountain, that valleyed hill called Calvary? but for the one I call Good Shepherd, who like a lamb was slain for me. 
There's not a thing that you could do to earn God's love. It's not a thing that you could do to earn his forgiveness or his healing. He makes it really simple. He says, believe. It's simple. It's not always easy because it comes with humility. You have to come humbly. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so we come to him humbly. Whether we've been following him for years or maybe... Uh, never at all. We come to him humbly and we find that there's freedom and there's forgiveness of sins when we come to Jesus. Hey, just a few kind of final thoughts, a few takeaways. We talked about three servants prior to talking about Jesus. We talked about how the slave girl was worrying. She was concerned for the well-being of her oppressor. So is there an oppressor in your life, an enemy in your life that you need to pray for? that you need to hope good, that you need to want good for them. That before you leave tonight, you say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to pray for them, and I'm going to pray that, that, that God blesses them. When we talked about the, the wise servants, um, Naaman's wise servants, who is God calling you to speak up to? To caution, to encourage, or to exhort? How can you be a wise servant to somebody else? And then we talked about the worshiping servant, Naaman. He was a changed man, and he was invested in worshiping the true God. So maybe the question for us is, what things do we need to surrender? What idols do we need to forsake so that we can fully enter into worshiping the one true living God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're a good God, that you love us so lavishly, that you would stop at nothing to save us, that you did all of the work that we never could so that we could enter into the goodness of knowing you. And Father, I pray for people who came here tonight and they need healing. I pray for the people who are hurting, that are devastated. Maybe it's a physical sickness or maybe there's something spiritual happening where they're so desperately separated from you, where they have no hope, where they live in depression. God, would you heal them? Would you bring them to yourself? Would you show them that you are the God that can save and that you are the God that can heal? And I ask for those of us who have followed you, are following you, would you make us like that little servant girl that esteemed others greater than herself? Jesus, we don't ask that we would start hating ourselves, but that we would just stop thinking of ourselves so much. Would you make us look more like you? Would you set us out, send us out into this city, into this world? to be life changers, to bring you into our conversation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you would like somebody to pray with or talk to right after service, maybe you don't have a right relationship with God, it's simple. It's simple. Come talk. Come pray with one of us. We would love to lead you in a prayer to help you surrender your life to Jesus and find freedom and healing in Him. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.